Good morning, church. I want to begin just a couple of minutes early this morning and make you aware of uh, something that uh, we should acknowledge. We are to show honor to whom honor is due. And every Sunday, almost without exception, we have a faithful member of our music team that prepares us for worship beforehand, leads us during congregational singing, and then helps us as we leave to be singing the, the thoughts and the words of, of worship. And today is uh, Chuck Anno's, our organist, Chuck Anno's 35th anniversary as the organist of First Baptist Church. Thirty-five years is a long time to do something as faithfully and responsibly as he's done it, and he is going to help us even now prepare our hearts for worship. So would you give your attention uh, to the Lord as Chuck leads us in this preparation for worship?
Well, good morning. Welcome to worship here at First Baptist Church. We are so happy to see each and every one of you here today. And we want to continue to worship God together as we celebrate baptism with these whom God has saved. You know, the Bible tells us that baptism is our public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord. When we're baptized, we declare to the world that we have trusted in Jesus Christ, placed our faith in Him, we've repented of our sins, and that His death, burial, and resurrection were on our behalf. We're rejoicing this morning with these who God has saved and they are being baptized. This is Anthony DeAngelis. And Anthony and his fiance that will follow him in baptism came to my office just a few months ago desiring to be married. And in that first session, we talked about the gospel. And they came to the decision that they had not trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior and as their Lord. And soon after that, they did trust in Jesus, and now they're desiring to be baptized today. In fact, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, we're going to have a wedding out at the beach. And so we're all very excited for today as we get to celebrate together. Here's a little bit of what Anthony wants you to know this morning. I was trusting in my own will and selfish actions. I didn't trust anyone to make decisions other than myself. I was confronted with the gospel, and I realized that we're all dependent on God, our Creator, to be saved. We cannot do it on our own. I repented of my sin and trusted in Christ alone for my salvation. Now I am not worried like I used to be. I'm allowing my stressful times to be guided by the Lord rather than trying to change them myself. I'm resting in God alone. So, Anthony, have you trusted in Jesus Christ and Him alone for salvation? Yes. Then I baptize you today, my brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And this is Lindsay LaBarbera. She'll be our bride this afternoon. And here's what Lindsay wants you to know. I was chasing after worldly things and the acceptance of others. I was a rebel apart from the Lord. I read the gospel, though, and saw how I can never do life on my own. I needed to repent and trust Jesus. I did that as I surrendered to His Lordship in my life. I realized that only God's opinion of me matters, and I want to live life to please Him. I'm sensing Him providing for me and giving me peace in the middle of the trials I face each day. Lindsay, have you trusted in Jesus Christ and Him alone to save you? Yes. Then because of that, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is Oleg Yelchaninov. And here's the story that Oleg wants you to know. I was born into a Christian family However, growing up, I did not value God or His Word, and I lived for the world. As time went on, I became very sick to the point where I was unable to work, eat, and even sleep. God used these situations in my life to show me my desperate need for my Savior, Jesus Christ. I repented and trusted in Jesus for salvation. Today, Jesus is my rock, my Savior, and my only hope. I can now approach God with confidence because of Jesus Christ. Glory be to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, Oleg, 
Have you trusted in Jesus Christ and him alone for your salvation? Yes. Then I want to baptize you today, my brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Well, would you join me as we pray together? Dear Lord Jesus, how we thank you and how we praise you and how we worship you this morning for the work that you have done by your grace through the faith that you have given in the life of each of these three that we've seen baptized this morning. We pray for each of them that they will walk lives that will reflect your son, Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord Jesus, for all of us that are gathered here today, that you would be exalted in our life, that you would give us strength as we seek to work for you each and every day because of the love that we have for you, not to gain favor with you. Lord Jesus, we love you. We bow before you today and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. What a powerful reminder that when we come to know Christ, we know Him both in His death and His resurrection. Paul says in Philippians 3.10 that he wanted to know Him, meaning Christ, and the power of His resurrection, that He may share His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. Worship is an opportunity to know both the death through the cross and the resurrection and life that only Christ can provide. So we gather this morning with that singular prayer of our heart that we may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. Let's stand and determine to know Him more.
then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull, and they crucified him. It was the third hour. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last.
Would you read this together, church? Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Now we must follow him as good disciples in the way of suffering, the way of life. When the sea is calm and all is right, when I feel your face. the scriptures out of Philippians 1 through 6, 3 to 6. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always reappearing prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, for I am confident that this very thing 
that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Jesus. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, all of life is worship. And at the same time, we come here together to gather together to worship our great God. We have an opportunity to continue in worship now as we prepare to give our tithes and offerings. You know, just before this worship service each week, we have a Life Together class, a membership class. And with some other pastors, I'm on a rotation of teaching that, and I just taught it this morning. And we tell people as they're in the process of joining our church that one of the things it means to be a member is to give. To give out of the grace that God's given you and to join in partnership with our church as we try to reach this city. So each week as the offering plate is passed and we come to this point in the service, it's not just an opportunity to give, but it's a reminder to give. It's a prompt to give. And some of you have faithfully given online throughout the week, and we're so thankful for your faithfulness in that way. But for the rest of us who have not given in that way, this is our reminder, an opportunity we have to faithfully give and to join in partnership to spread the name of Christ in Jacksonville and around the city. And if you're here visiting with us, we're so thankful we're here. What we want to most ask of you is an opportunity to get to know you. So you can grab this Connect card in the pew in front of you and fill this out and just drop it on that offering plate when it comes around. And that'll give us an opportunity to follow up with you and get to know you and answer any questions you might have and help you get plugged in our church. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and thank him for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we echo the words of, prayer of Paul that we just read in that scripture passage from Philippians 1. We make our prayer of joy because of our participation in the gospel, because of our partnership in the gospel, because when you overcame our sin and rebellion and brought us into union with Christ, you didn't just leave us there by ourselves, but you brought not just an older brother in the Lord Jesus Christ, but many brothers and sisters who are here in this church with us. We get to partner together. We get to strengthen our work in this city as we do it together. And one of the ways we do that is by giving, so we can pool our resources so the name of Christ can be proclaimed. I pray now, Father, as we come together, that we might be serious about that partnership. We might be reminded of the grace that we've received. We won't want to give out of that grace, out of thankfulness for Jesus. Help us now, Father, to be faithful participants, faithful partners, faithful members of the fellowship of Jesus Christ and of this church as we give. I pray all this in his name. Amen.
we really need to re-examine how we do ministry. If we're serious about reaching this city for Jesus Christ, then we have to you know, put all the options on the table of what that is going to take. When God blesses something, He doesn't just give you enough. He doesn't just you know, provide the bare minimum, right? He, he, he blesses faithfulness in an abundance. But there's a ton of work to be done. And so I would, I would encourage the church family, start actively looking for a place to serve. Don't wait for somebody to come up to you and say, hey, we need you to volunteer. You need to go find that place. Go find that place to serve and get involved right away. You know, that, that will lead to new opportunities and new ways to do ministry to reach a new generation for Jesus Christ. And at the end of that, when that, when we've been successful in that, when God has walked us through that, so I think at the end, you know, our minds are just gonna be blown about how God has been faithful to us and how he's um, used our faithfulness to spread his name and to reach people for Jesus Christ. I think it's gonna be amazing when we look back at it. And we've seen the lives that have been changed, the people that have given their heart to Jesus. You know, we'll be glad that we really re-examined how we do ministry so we could be effective in that, in that mission. Good morning, First Baptist. It is always great to be with you every week, and that is true this week as well. If you think about it, uh, you're going to have to wait until this exact time next week to be in a room with this many amazing people. So you got to relish it while we have it together. Let me ask you to turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 3. Nehemiah chapter 3. We are taking some time this fall to go through the book of Nehemiah because in the days of Nehemiah, the folks realized that God had a continuing story for them. The story was not done just because the times were hard, and we are realizing that together as a church as well. We are committing ourselves to a bold and exciting future of ministry out of this church to this city. We believe God has a continuing story for us. And we are taking time to learn from Nehemiah some principles that were true for him in his day about God's continuing story that we can apply to our day. And we come this week to Nehemiah chapter 3, Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 1, and this is what God says. Then Eliashib, the high priest, arose with his brothers, the priests, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors. They consecrated the wall to the Tower of the Hundred and the Tower of Hananel. Next to him, the men of Jericho built, and next to him, Zakur, the son of Imri, built. Now the sons of Hasanaah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. Next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakoz, made repairs. And next to him, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezabel, made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, the son of Bana, also made repairs. Moreover, next to him, the Tekoites made repairs, but their nobles did not support the work of their masters. Joyada, the son of Paseah, and Meshulam, the son of Besedea, repaired the old gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and its bars. Next to them, Melathiah, the Gibeonite, and Jaden, the Maranathite, the men of Gibeon and of Mitzpah, also made repairs for the official seat of the governor of the province beyond the river. Next to him, Uziel, the son of Heraheia, of the goldsmiths, made repairs. And next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, made repairs. And they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Next to them, Rephaiah, the son of Hur, the official of half the district of Jerusalem, made repairs. Next to them, Judea, the son of Haramoth, made repairs opposite his house. And next to him, Atush, the son of Hashbaneah, made repairs. Malchijah, the son of Haram, and Hashub, the son of Pehath Moab, repaired another section of the Tower of Furnaces. Next to him, Shalom, the son of Halohesh, the official of half the district of Jerusalem, made repairs, he and his daughters. Hanan and the inhabitants of Zenoa repaired the valley gate. They built it and hung its doors with its bolts and its bars and a thousand cubits of the wall to the refuse gate. Malchijah, the son of Rechab, the official of the district of beth Hakarim, repaired the refuse gate. He built it and hung its doors with its bolts and its bars. 
Shalem, the son of Kol Jose, the official of the district of Mitzpah, repaired the fountain gate. He built it, covered it, and hung its doors with its bolts and its bars in the wall of the pool of Shelah at the king's garden as far as the steps that descend from the city of David. After him, Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, official of half the district of Beth Zur, made repairs as far as a point opposite the tombs of David and as far as the artificial pool in the house of the mighty men. After him, the Levites carried out repairs under Rehum, the son of Bani. Next to him, Hashabiah, the official of half the district of Kela, carried out repairs for his district. After him, their brothers carried out repairs under Bavai, the son of Hinadad, official of the other half of the district of Kela. Next to him, Ezer, the son of Jeshua, the official of Mitzpah, repaired another section in front of the ascent of the armory at the angle. After him, Baruch, the son of Zabai, zealously repaired another section from the angle to the doorway of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. After him, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakoz, repaired another section from the doorway to Eliashib's house, even as far as the end of his house. After him, the priests, the men of the valley, carried out repairs. After them, Benjamin and Hashub carried out repairs in front of their house. After them, Azariah, the son of Maaseiah, son of Ananiah, carried out repairs beside his house. After him, Benwi, the son of Hinadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah, as far as the angle and as far as the corner. Halal, the son of Uzai, made repairs in front of the angle and the tower projecting from the upper house of the king, which is by the court of the guard. After him, Padea, the son of Parosh, made repairs. The temple servants living in Ophel made repairs as far as the front of the water gate toward the east and the projecting tower. After them, the Tekoites repaired another section in front of the great projecting tower and as far as the wall of Ophel. Above the horse gate, the priests carried out repairs each in front of his house. After them, Zadok, the son of Immer, carried out repairs in front of his house. And after him, Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, carried out repairs. And after him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanan, the sixth son of Zalaph, repaired another section. After him, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, carried out repairs in front of his own quarters. And after him, Malchijah, one of the goldsmiths, carried out repairs as far as the house of the temple servants and of the merchants in front of the inspection gate and as far as the upper room of the corner. Between the upper room of the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants carried out repairs. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you, David. We better pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for the word of God. Would you cause your word by the power of your spirit to come up out of these pages that we have read? Would you press it down into our hearts, Father, and make us like Christ? And as we are conformed into his image, would you make it so that Jesus Christ shines out of this place and Jacksonville is saved? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's encouraging uh, after having read that to look up and find that you're still here. Uh, there was plenty of time for you to get up and go find someplace else to go. If, uh, if you're here this morning and you're a visitor and you, uh, maybe you brought a visitor, uh, you might be wondering what in the world is happening. Uh, there is uh, sections of the Bible that we like to kind of fast forward through. If you're committed to reading through the Bible and maybe you come to the book of Nehemiah and you're all excited about it and you're going to pray through it and have your devotions in it, and then you get to Nehemiah chapter 3 and about the time in verse 1 when you get to Eliashib, you start to say, well, I think we can just move on to the juicier parts of this thing. And you wonder why I did not do that when we come to this uh, on a Sunday morning with your visitors here in your row so you don't have to while I'm reading it go, he never does this. It's not usually this way. Why would I read this to you? Why, after a hard week, would I make you endure more hardship with Malchijah and Shalom and supercalifragilisticexpialidocious and whoever those people are? Why would I do that to you? 
Well, there's a couple of reasons. One reason is because Jesus Christ himself says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That means that this chapter of Scripture, as it is in the Bible, has life in it. It proceeds from the mouth of God, and it is really good for you to hear it, to read it, and to pay attention to it. But it's not just that general reason that I expose you to that. There's a very important reason why, in the context of the book of Nehemiah, I want you to hear all of those names and all of those jobs. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, we read that these are the words of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is telling us what happened to him, and he tells us how he was minding his own business in Persia when a really bad report comes to him about the state of his homeland. And he spends a lot of time thinking and praying about this. He comes up with a plan. He tells us in the book how he goes to the king. And against all odds, the king gives him permission to go do the work that he wants to do. And so he saddles up and he goes down the road and he makes it all the way to Jerusalem. And he goes around the perimeter of the city and he spends time thinking and planning and coming up with a way to deal with all of this mess. And then he stands up in Nehemiah chapter 2 and he explains to them that he's got a plan and he wants them to move forward with him. And there's this really exciting moment at the end of Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 18. He told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. And they said, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. They have, hearing his plan and hearing his passion, they've made a commitment to the work. But by the time we get to Nehemiah chapter 3, no work has happened yet. By the time we get to Nehemiah chapter 3, Nehemiah has a great idea. He has a plan. He has enlisted some support from the people. But no progress has been made. Nehemiah is out on a limb by the time he gets to Nehemiah chapter 3. I really think that when Nehemiah sat down a couple thousand years ago with his quill pen to write the book of Nehemiah, I think Nehemiah chapter 3 must have been his favorite chapter to write. Because in Nehemiah chapter 3, he's talking about how this plan, this dream, this vision that he has that God's people's story would continue, now it's actually happening. The work is actually taking place, and it's not just taking place magically with stones lifting off the ground and being placed on the wall. It's happening with the names and faces of people that he knows and loves and respects. He's able to walk by and see Malchijah doing work that if Malchijah doesn't do, it's not going to happen. He's able to walk and see Shalom doing work that if Shalom doesn't do it, it's not going to happen. This is exciting and thrilling in the grand scheme of redemptive history that the work that God has called Nehemiah to do is now happening through the people. There is a powerful lesson in this chapter that we're tempted to skip over. And the powerful lesson is that a continuing story for God's people requires partnership. This is a story about the people of God being in the work together. This is a story about God doing his work, not without people and not with just one person, but with a group of people who have names and faces and lives. They invest together. They become partners. I want to look for a few moments this morning at three requirements about our partnership together in order for this continuing story to happen at First Baptist. The first requirement is that our continuing story requires all kinds of you doing work. This plan that we are pursuing together to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to a whole city, to see thousands, thousands upon thousands of men and women, boys and girls, families all over this city come to faith in Jesus Christ. This plan requires all kinds of you doing work. That means 
that if you believe the part you have to play at First Baptist Church is you come in here every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock or 1045 and sit here And when it's over, you collect your things and leave. If that's what you believe your role is, this thing won't work. Because the continuing story requires all kinds of you doing work. First Baptist Church doesn't just happen. These lights don't just magically come on. The kids across the street just don't get taken care of. The room doesn't just get cleaned. All of that is massive amounts of investment from hundreds and thousands of people. One of the things I want you to notice when you pay attention to these names in Nehemiah chapter 3, you notice that all kinds of people were doing the work. There was nobody that had too lofty a position to do the hard work. We read in Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 1 about the high priest rolling up his sleeves and doing hard work. Eliashib, the high priest, arose with his brothers, the priests, and built the sheep gate. There were rich people that got busy doing work. Goldsmiths, in chapter 3, verse 8. Next to him, Uziel, the son of Herhea, of the goldsmiths, made repairs. The same thing in verse 32. Between the upper room of the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths did their repairs. There were perfumers. Verse 8. Next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, made repairs. This guy's job is to mix chemicals that smell good. But he did not get all prissified about it and refused to roll up his sleeves and pick up rocks. He wasn't too good for the hard work. He wasn't in too lofty a position for it. There were city officials. In chapter 3, verse 9, next to them, Raphaia, the son of Hur, the official of half the district of Jerusalem. Same thing in verse 12, next to him, Shalom, the son of Halohesh, the official of half the district of Jerusalem. These are city officials with big, important work, and they could say, I'm not going to go out there and do that. I got hard stuff I got to do in here. I'm a perfumer. I'm a goldsmith. I'm not doing that. There were business people who got busy doing the work. In verse 32, between the upper room of the corner of the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants carried out repairs. There was nobody that had too important a position to be involved in the hard work of God's continuing story in the days of Nehemiah. There was nobody in too lofty a position, and there was nobody in too low a position to do the hard work either. There were normal, average, everyday citizens. In chapter 3, verse 13, Hanan and the inhabitants of Zenoa. The inhabitants of Zenoa, whoever, whoever cares about them? The inhabitants of Zenoa might say, nobody cares about us. This is God's city, this is Jerusalem, we don't need to be involved in that. But they weren't in too low a position to do the work. There were temple servants. Verse 26, the temple servants living in Ophel made repairs as far as the front of the water gate. If anybody could say, hey, these are God's people, this is God's city, this is God's work, we don't need to be involved in God's work. We don't need to be involved in something this big, something of this redemptive historical consequence. We don't need to be doing that. The important people can do that. They didn't say that. They rolled up their sleeves and got to work. Daughters got involved. I love this one. Verse 12, next to him, Shalom, the son of Halohesh, the official of half the district of Jerusalem, made repairs, he and his daughters. It's the first instance in recorded history of take your daughter to work day. (laughs) There was, I mean, just imagine this. Imagine Shalom saying, hey, girls, come on. I want you to come with me. We're going to do some work on on the wall and the gates today. Come with me. Well, those girls could have said, oh, we we don't need to be involved in all of that. But Nehemiah saddled up one day, and there was Shalom, and there were his girls working together to advance the kingdom and ensure God's continuing story. I'm telling you what, Nehemiah's heart had to light up when he saw the people of God from all different positions, from all different classes of people linking hands to do the work together. One of my favorite things 
about First Baptist Church. One of my very favorite things, and I have a lot of favorite things, but one of my very favorite things about First Baptist Church is in this room, there are all different kinds of people. We have in this room right now today, some of the wealthiest people in Jacksonville. And we have in this room right now today, people who are barely making it. We have in this room right now today people who are holding responsible positions in elected office, and we have people who are out of work and they can't work. We have wise and mature, godly people, and we have little kids who barely can say the name of Jesus. We have people all over the map in this wonderful, glorious, great room, and what are we all doing here? We're here together in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ brings us all together, rich and poor, big powerful jobs and unemployed, young, old, here we are all together and there is work for every single one of us. If you are here and you are not involved, that's your problem. You can't blame it on your high position and you can't blame it on your low position. You just need to get involved. Our continuing story requires all kinds of you doing work, whoever you are. Second point, our continuing story requires all kinds of you doing all kinds of work. All kinds of you, whatever class you're in, whatever age group you're in, all kinds of you doing all kinds of work. You... uh, Read Nehemiah chapter 3, and there's a number of different kinds of work that's happening. Some people are building. They're starting from scratch, from the ground up, and going like that. There's some people who are repairing walls. There's some people who are repairing gates. There's some people who are doing that kind of work on the walls and the gates. There's other people who are doing the work on houses. All those people who are doing that work have to be fed. They all have to be protected. We'll find out more about that later. There is work for everybody, and it's all over the map. What I want you to know is there is work for you to do in this church. If you are sitting there thinking, I will wait until 21 when everything's settled down to get involved, we won't make it. We need you now. We need you today. We need you right now today to be involved. There's all kinds of work for you to do. There's all sorts of ways you can serve this body right now today. Some of you can serve with financial gifts, with financial effort. Some of you are here and you don't contribute to the work of this ministry with your financial gifts. We need you to stop doing that and to start engaging financially with this church. Some of you give, but you give a little bit. We need you to give more, and we need you to give regularly. We need you to invest in the kingdom of Christ and not just in your own personal life. Some of you give regularly, but you need to step it up and give sacrificially. Some of you need to work and pray and ask God to do something powerful in your heart to let go of the stranglehold money and wealth can have on your life and let go of some things and do without some things and make an investment in the kingdom of Christ here at this church. Some of you liked that, others not so much. (laughs) All right. It's still true though. We need you to do it. I mean, we have bills that we have to pay every single month, and we've got a great big bill coming on demolition and construction that we're going to have to pay. I told you, whatever you give, we won't borrow. If you don't want to borrow money, then help me get $30 million. There are people in here who you wonder if you should make a big financial investment in the kingdom of Christ at this church, and you should. This is that time. Some of you can serve in that way. There are some of you who maybe your, your abilities are limited, but you could be generous financially. There's other people, you have other ways that you could serve. You couldn't be generous financially because of this, that, or the other reason. You've fallen on hard times. Or maybe you can, but you can still serve in other ways as well. I don't even know how to tell you how many needs we have every week, every day at First Baptist Church. We have media needs 
We have church-wide fellowships, our Life Together fellowships that require hundreds of people working and planning and preparing. We've got Christmas coming up. It's just right around the corner. Uh, we need all sorts of volunteers for the Christmas events that we're going to be having around here to reach out to our community. Shortly after that, we'll have pastor's conference. We need hundreds of you to volunteer uh, to help meet the needs of the thousands of people that are going to be here for pastor's conference. Every time we are in this building, our preschool and elementary students need help. They're across the street, and they need people teaching them the Bible. They need people loving on them. And you know that. It's just that most of you don't want to be one of the people to do it. We need you to sign up and volunteer. You, there is nobody in this room too rich and powerful to take care of kids. They're, they're the future. We want to make a gospel investment of them, and we need you to help with that. We've got Trunk of Treats coming up. You know our most important outreach event at First Baptist Church in the last year was Trunk of Treats? We made more contact with unbelievers. We had more follow-up visits with Trunk of Treats than any other event, including the Passion Play. We need people to volunteer to serve the ministry needs of the folks who are going to be here for that really important event. We need small group leaders for middle and high school students. For our senior adults, we need Sunday school leadership and people involved in visitation. We've got more needs than you can possibly imagine. You can find out about them at fbcjacks.com slash serve. Let me tell you something, if you care about what I'm saying at all, the Lord right now is placing on your heart to be involved in service at this church, and we need you to do it. Nehemiah knew it. Nehemiah knew his plan and his idea could get nowhere until he walks around and he sees these people walking on the wall. We need you on the wall to see God's continuing story. Our continuing story requires all kinds of you doing work. Our continuing story requires all kinds of you doing all kinds of work. And then finally, our continuing story requires all of us trusting in the work of God. Our continuing story requires all of us trusting in the work of God. We need people on the wall. Nehemiah needed people on the wall. That is absolutely true. When God does something, to continue the story of his people, he uses his people to continue the story. It's absolutely true. But that's not what we trust in. That's not the anchor for our hope. Success in God's continuing story is found in what God does, not what we do. It's important that we work, but it's even more important that God work for us. Nehemiah said in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 20, I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven and earth will give us success. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. Why are the people going to stand up? Why are they going to work? Why are they going to serve? Because they have confidence that the God of heaven will give them success. When you have a guarantee from God that the work is going to succeed, that will add fruitfulness and enthusiasm to your labor. Now, I need to be really careful here. The Bible does not guarantee that God will grant success to any idea we've got. Just because we have an idea doesn't mean God is going to make it be successful. There is a difference between presuming on God and trusting in God. We always want to trust in God. We presume on God when we demand that He grant success to everything we do. I'm not presuming on God, and you shouldn't either. But there is a sweet promise that Jesus gives for the work of the church. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. He says, I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Jesus says that he establishes his church. Jesus says that when his church is established, no enemy can prevail against it, not even hell. 
the work of the church is guaranteed from Jesus Christ to succeed. It's a guarantee. It's a promise. Even the worst enemy you can imagine, hell itself, can't defeat the church of Jesus Christ. Will welcome to the church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ, his own body that can never, ever, for all eternity, be defeated. When we are faithful to Jesus Christ, when we are faithful to his word, as long as we are waiting for his return, we're given a guarantee of success. It's not just in Matthew 16, the Apostle Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. He's talking about a gospel partnership. He's talking about you and me who are coming together in gospel partnership to advance the kingdom. And he says in verse 6, I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. The work of Jesus Christ to perfect his people began in his perfect life where he never sinned. It continued with his brutal death where he bled out for your sins and for mine. It continued in his burial and in his resurrection where he literally, physically walked out of the grave after being dead for three days. It continued as he ascended into heaven. It continues right now, right now, today. He's just as alive as I am interceding, praying for you and for me. And his work will continue in your life through every struggle, through every pain, through every difficulty, through every sin. He is going to keep you and hold you fast. He will never, ever let you go. When you repent of your sin and trust in him, you are locked into him forever and ever and ever. And his work will never fail in your life. But Philippians, what I just read, though we apply that individually and it's right that we should, it's written to a church. It's not written to an individual, it's written to a church. It's written to a group of people and it comes down to us. And there is a promise here that we can apply to First Baptist Church. That in 1836, God began a good work with a group of people called the First Baptist Church of Jacksonville. And that work isn't complete. It's not complete because Jesus hasn't come back yet. It's not his day yet. And so here we are together, you and me with the work yet incomplete and with a guarantee from Jesus Christ that it will be completed. He does not care about deferred maintenance. He does not care about the size of auditoriums. He does not care about debt. He does not care about recessions. He does not care about how the culture doesn't like Christians anymore. He doesn't care that the culture hates truth. He's just going to complete the work. He will do it, it's a promise. He's going to complete this work through us. This is going to happen. Not because I'm so smart, not because we're all such great, wonderful, hard workers, but because Jesus Christ is a Savior who will not let up in your life and in mine and in the life of our church until the work is done. I'm going to tell you something. Um, I knew about First Baptist Church before I got here. I'd heard about you. I knew a lot of the stories. When I got here uh, in January of 2016, Lauren and I quickly realized that apart from any reputation 
this church has, there's something special about this place. Stick with me here for just a second. I'm off book, so we'll trust the Lord here. We quickly realized there was something special about this place. Something that makes this church, I've been to churches all over the world, and there's something about this church that's different. There's something about this church that's special. That's not a boast to have it been here long enough to take credit for anything. I'm just talking about you. And for years, I have had a growing list of what is it? What is it about this place that works? There's a lot of, there's a lot of items on my list. One thing I figured out early, and I figured out early from you, well, I, I'd been here about two seconds when all of you guys started talking about Homer Lindsay. Homer Lindsay. We're so thankful for Homer Lindsay. And he taught us to love Jesus, and he taught us to be thankful, and he taught us how to win souls. And I'm so thankful for that, and I don't have anything bad to say. I'm just thankful with you for a faithful shepherd who God had his hand on him, and it was a remarkable blessing. So without taking anything away from that, let me tell you something else I've noticed that I don't think you know, because I never hear anybody say it. The blessing that God poured out on this place, one of the evidences of it was leaders like Homer Lindsay, for absolutely positively certain. But I want you to know That even more amazing than that is the blessing God poured out on this place of you. I just don't think you see it. But I walk through the hallways every week and I talk to hundreds of people who love Jesus Christ, who love the Bible, who are passionate about investing their financial resources into this place, who are passionate about investing their talent and their time in this place. I want you to know that the thing that makes First Baptist Church so amazing under heaven is you. It's your work. It's your investment. It's the gospel gospel conversations that you have. It's the investment that you have made. There are people in this room who are going to live forever in heaven because of other people in this room. There are people in this city who don't know yet that they're going to live forever in heaven, but they will because of the same people in this room. There are missionaries being funded overseas right now because of the investment of the people in this room. Listen, listen, if you want to clap for yourself, clap, but I'm just going to keep talking to you for a second. I want to let you know that the miracle of downtown Jacksonville was you more than any leader you can mention. And that's the truth. And I say that with respect for all of the good ones. I read all of those names to you in Nehemiah chapter 3. Because one day, the book is going to be written about the continuing story of First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, Florida. And I will be offended if somebody tries to tell that story and leaves you out of it. And I think Nehemiah would be offended if he went to all this trouble to write this book and he knew that God equipped the people to do the work and he thought some preacher in 2019 in Jacksonville, Florida would erase the names of the people that he cared so much about who were responsible for the work. I wouldn't want somebody to do that to you and I'm not gonna do it to them. So for every Malchijah in Nehemiah chapter three, there's a, there's a Brenda and a Victoria who decorate for Christmas here in Jacksonville. For every Shalom, there's an Amy and a Cody and a Sean who's doing the work here at First Baptist. For, for every single one of those names, There's a Richard, there's an RC, there's 
some K's, whose names are inextricably attached to the continuing story of First Baptist Church. I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful to see God's work in you as you invest. I'm so thankful to one day tell the story about what God did in this church through you. There's a continuing story for First Baptist Church. It's going to be great. I don't know all the details, but we'll have an opportunity to celebrate it one day. And when we tell the story, we won't tell the story about what God did alone. We'll tell the story about who God did it through. And by God's grace, it's going to be all of us together. Let's stand and let's pray. Father in heaven, you began the good work in each of our lives on the cross of Jesus Christ. And you're culminating it in the First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, Florida in 2019. Father, thank you for the First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, Florida. Christians from every class of person Christians from every job, every walk of life who just love Jesus, who love Jesus and want to teach Sunday school and clean up floors and hang Christmas decorations and drive guests and visitors all over the place and make sure people know how to get to the bathroom when they're new and they don't know where it is, who take care of kids who preach the gospel, who give money, who play the organ while we pray for 35 years. It's such a visible sign of your grace to us to place us in the midst of thousands of people who only want to make an investment in the kingdom. Father, as our story continues, give us more of them. Give us more of it. Let us see the grace of Jesus in the sweat and the effort of his people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.